Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning into the fourth webinar in our series, Internal Carbon Pricing, Practical Experiences from the Private Sector. Before we get started, we have two housekeeping items to announce. One is on the software's question and answer functionality, and the second is a note from our lawyers. First, this webinar series is designed to be an open and interactive conversation, and you are invited to submit your questions via the Q&A function at any point during the event. You can find the Q&A function in the menu bar at the top of your screen. Due to time constraints, we'll not be able to address every question submitted today, but we'll answer as many as possible. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available online. Second, we would like to draw your attention to the following statement, which is being displayed on your screen currently, and I will read now. Throughout this webinar series, participants shall comply with competition law requirements and shall not enter into any discussion, activity, or conduct that may infringe any applicable competition law. By way of, of example, participants shall not discuss, communicate, or exchange any commercially sensitive information, including non-public information relating to prices, marketing and advertising strategy, cost and revenues, strategy in relation to decisions on internal project screening values, trading terms and conditions with third parties, including purchasing strategy, terms of supply, trade, or distribution strategy. This applies not only to discussions during formal meetings, but also to informal discussions before, during, and after meetings. Should the meeting discuss matters that contravene competition law requirements, it is the responsibility of participants to notify the moderator, who will discontinue the discussion or close the meeting. Many thanks for your attention. Now, we're pleased to welcome David back, Professor and Senior Associate Dean for the Executive MBA, Yale School of Management, who will moderate the webinar. Well, hello everybody. Welcome to this internal carbon pricing webinar series. My name is David Bach, and this is the fourth webinar in this series, which is jointly organized by the World Economic Forum, the Carbon Pricing Leadership Initiative, and Yale University. Uh, we're absolutely delighted to have senior leaders from Mahindra today. Uh, the leading Indian multinational that has been a real pioneer in the area of carbon pricing. And in fact, a company that has been a real pioneer in so many areas, and perhaps it shouldn't be surprised that it is a company, again, that has been ahead of the pack in India and indeed across emerging markets when it comes to this important issue of carbon pricing as an enabler of greater sustainability. Before I introduce um, our distinguished guests um, and uh, give them the opportunity to begin sharing uh, what they have learned, let me just uh, make a quick uh, personal comment. Um, uh, as we record this, it's been a few days only since the senseless and abhorrent murder of Srinivas Kuchivotla, an engineer from India uh, in Kansas City. Um, there are 165,000 Indian students in the United States studying uh, at the best universities we have, and I can tell you uh, from first-hand experience that these students are among the very best students you'll find anywhere in the world. There are about 300,000 Indian high school workers in this country, and without these students and these workers, university labs simply wouldn't work, financial firms could not function, technology firms could not innovate and grow, and most importantly, we'd be missing the incredibly important and rich cultural and other contributions they make to communities all across America. I've found this particular incident uh, incredibly shocking. Uh, I've been hardened by the outpouring of support from the community in the U.S., uh, but I just wanted to underscore uh, again uh, how, how terrible this incident uh, was, how senseless it is, and perhaps remind us that the best antidote to all kinds of prejudice and, and hate uh, and misinformation <coughs> is collaboration and engagement, and I'm grateful um, to all of our Indian students, our Indian colleagues and friends um, for their uh, engagement. Uh, with that, uh, let me uh, introduce um, uh, Dr. Pawan Gunka, who is the Managing Director of Mahindra and Mahindra. He's sitting there in the middle. Uh, we're also joined by the implementation lesson, uh, the implementation leaders of this um, initiative at Mahindra, uh, Mr. 
Anir Van Ghosh, who is the Chief Sustainability <coughs> Officer, and Mr. Vijay Kalara, who is the Chief of Manufacturing Operations. Um, Dr. Granka, if I can first turn to you uh, as Managing Director of Mahindra and Mahindra, really the person who has uh, a bird's eye view on the entire group. Um, why and how did the carbon pricing initiative get started at the group? What motivated the decision? Uh, thank you, David. <clears throat> now, let me first uh, thank you for the preamble uh, that you have given. Uh, you have talked about the contribution that uh, people of Indian origin make to U.S. Uh, and also uh, you have said that there is no place for uh, what happened uh, in, in, in a few days ago. And I hope that uh, such things do not happen anywhere in the world, uh, let alone in USA. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone who is uh, signed up. Um, since you have signed up for this webinar, uh, I presume that you are somewhat familiar with Mahindra and Mahindra and the Mahindra Group. But uh, let me first take, David, if it's all right, to take a couple of minutes to talk about Mahindra Group before I get into specific questions of carbon pricing. Uh, Mahindra uh, Group is uh, perhaps amongst the top five uh, business groups in India, leaving out the government-owned companies. Uh, we are in multiple businesses, uh, which include uh, automotive, uh, agriculture, micro-irrigation, financial services, information uh, technology, real estate, integrated cities, holiday resorts, uh, uh, solar power, uh, logistics, steel, or whatever else you can, you can think of. Uh, we don't call ourselves a conglomerate. We call ourselves a federation of businesses. And the reason for that is a very clear distinction that there is not a sort of a top level uh, coordination that happens where everything flows to the top, but every business vertical is governed almost independently by the heads of that business. Uh, Mahindra Group uh, has a structure whereby Mahindra and Mahindra Limited, uh, the company for which I'm the managing director, uh, is the company that has the operations of automotive, farm equipment, and agriculture businesses, and also is the investor in all the other businesses uh, that the Mahindra Group is responsible for. Mahindra and Mahindra Limited is about 50% of the group's revenue and uh, accounts for about 50% of group's emissions, carbon emission uh, that, that, that we have. Um, M&M Limited, as I said, is about automotive, uh, where we are a major player in SUVs in India and commercial vehicles, and about tractors, where we are the largest player, not just in India, but globally, uh, if you just look at the volume of tractors and not the size of tractors. Uh, and we also have a significant play in the agriculture field other than tractors. What our group has tried to do over the last uh, several years is uh, focus on globalization, focus on, uh, on a brand development, and we have vision that by 2021, we would be one of the top 50 brands, uh, respected brands in the world. What we have believed in is that business is not just about uh, volume, market share, and uh, bottom line. Uh, it is about a core purpose, a purpose that goes beyond uh, the, the profits and, and revenue. And we have actually formally uh, adopted RISE as the philosophy for Mahindra Group. Uh, and that's the reason you would always see Mahindra RISE written together and define a core purpose that we will challenge conventional thinking and innovatively use all our resources to drive positive change in the lives of our stakeholders and communities across the world to enable them to rise. Now, these are not just empty words, uh, uh, but this is about the culture that we're trying to imbibe within organization and also take it outside. And that is one of the reasons why we are so interested in making a contribution towards, uh, towards sustainability and towards reducing carbon emissions. When we, when we look at uh, the carbon price and what uh, sort of uh, drove us towards uh, declaring a carbon price, I think this group does not need to be told that uh, uh, this is one of the major concern that we have on our planet and the carbon emission. This group knows that very well. And we also know that unchecked, the problem is going to get worse and worse to a point of becoming unsustainable. Human life by nature is carbon intensive uh, and especially emerging economies as they become more prosperous, such as India, uh, the problem of carbon emission will in fact get, get worse. 
So while there is a lot of debate going on in various fora on uh, whether the emerging economies uh, should be restricted the same as developed economies, uh, that's not what we want to get into. Uh, what we need to get into is how do we play our role? How do we do what we can do to try and make a small contribution towards uh, solving the, uh, the, the problem of carbon emission in the world? And therefore, uh, what we decided uh, some time ago uh, that uh, we needed to, uh, uh, being in the automotive industry, we are one of the uh, unfortunate polluter uh, in terms of carbon, uh, and therefore we need to do our, our our job in terms of how do we make our operations uh, uh, emit less carbon. And we started looking at, uh, at, at at carbon pricing, which I'll come to in a, in, in a second. Uh, but I should also mention that we are uh, happy that we are uh, first in the world to commit to doubling energy productivity in EP100 by 2030. We are the first in India to declare an internal carbon price, and we have a commitment to reduce our specific carbon footprint by 25% over the next three years. The question of uh, how did we get into carbon pricing and why did we decide on a certain value that we have, which is $10 per ton of carbon emitted, uh, first needs to be answered by saying how we're defining carbon pricing. The way I understand, and I'm not an expert, uh, my colleague on the left is an expert on this and he will talk more about it. But first we decided what is, how do we measure carbon pricing? And the way we did it was to say the value of all investments that we make and initiatives that we take to reduce the carbon footprint of the corporation will be $10 per ton of carbon that we emit. So why did we choose this uh, and why $10? Uh, we looked at what we have been doing without any specific uh, push towards carbon uh, emission reduction. And we found that naturally we were doing things that were right for the business in terms of return on investment. At the same time, we're helping to reduce carbon emission. And we calculated that that number was coming to some six, seven dollars uh, uh, by itself uh, when we when start putting the numbers together. And we said that if we push ourselves a little bit more and take a higher objective to say ten dollars, then we would find innovatively more and more things to do that will not only be reducing carbon footprint, but at the same time would help tremendously uh, in terms of business output, in terms of return on investment. I must say that so far, everything that we have done uh, has a very clear financial justification. So none of it has been done just to be nice, just to reduce carbon footprint, uh, just to make a contribution to, 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 to sustainability, but also makes a great business sense. So let me give you a few examples of what we have done. Uh, and, and, and these are fairly straightforward and most people who are on this webinar perhaps can relate to it, may have done several of these things themselves. But one of the big things happening in India right now uh, is conversion to LED lighting. Uh, and the LED lighting is something that we decided uh, last year that we will convert all our plants, all our lighting uh, to LED, where we invested uh, approximately $4 million uh, and we found return on our investment in less than one year. That means we saved uh, that amount of money in less than one year. So it's still work in progress, but this was a major thing that we did uh, in terms of carbon footprint. Then we are using more and more renewable energy. We already have 2.5 megawatt of solar and 4.2 megawatt of wind power. Uh, and about 5% of total energy that we consume uh, comes from renewable sources. We have extensive heat recovery projects and manufacturing uh, setup, which we could talk about more a little bit later. In the last seven years, I'm proud to say that we have reduced our carbon footprint, uh, specific carbon footprint by 44%. Uh, and this is even without putting any uh, specific uh, sort of effort that is outside what will be good business practice. Uh, and we have taken a target now that in the next three years, we will further reduce our specific carbon footprint by 25%. And for this, of course, we'll make additional investment and so on. Now, this is what we are doing within our operations, but our products, which do emit carbon, unfortunately, that is our vehicles and tractors, uh, we're doing a lot of work there. And one of the things that I would uh, like to add here is that Mahindra is the only company in India that sells 
four wheeled electric vehicles. Uh, we, are the, we are the only company right now that sells four wheeled electric vehicles. And we have put a lot of our effort behind electric vehicles in, uh, in, in helping to reduce the uh, carbon footprint. So as we move forward, uh, uh, we uh, hope that we would uh, be able to demonstrate uh, how uh, carbon pricing uh, has helped us to continue to keep our focus on reducing our carbon footprint, specific carbon footprint, how we have been able to do it, not just because it is a good thing to do, but also because it gives a business return, it reduces our variable costs, uh, and also gives us uh, somewhat of a uh, I would say respect uh, as a corporation that is uh, that is uh, putting environment uh, in front of us as we move forward in our business. So I will stop there uh, and uh, let uh, David ask any other questions that you may want to ask. Fantastic. Thank you so much for this comprehensive introduction. And I think uh, by now, even those who perhaps did not know uh, as much about the Mahindra Group as they should, you know, must be impressed by the breadth of uh, of business activities and also the ambition, I think, behind the sustainability initiatives. You went through a whole range of very, very ambitious goals. And, and uh, you know, I'd say that you'd have to look hard to find other companies uh, that put uh, so many uh, ambitious goals in front of themselves. But then again, the company has a record of achieving them and doing it in a way that uh, benefits communities as reflected in the RISE philosophy. Um, I wondered if you could say a little bit more about how uh, the fact that the group functions as a federation comes into play. And I say that because you have so many diverse businesses. And I suppose, you know, carbon and energy are uh, perhaps uh, along with uh, human capital and, and financial capital, those are probably the three common inputs. But beyond that, there's a lot of uh, diversity and divergence in terms of the businesses. So um, as you're thinking about the implementation of an initiative like this first <clears throat> group. Um, what are some of the critical issues uh, to keep in mind? Is this something that helps a group come closer to together? Uh, is this something that spurs competition within a group? Or does it generate a whole lot of tension because clearly no size <coughs> solution to all businesses? Well, uh, it's it's somewhat of a difficult question to answer, David. But let me let me try. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that what we are doing in uh, the the sort of mother company that is Mahindra and Mahindra uh, is intended to create competition within the group uh, because uh, that's not the intent. But in some sense, since we are the largest part of the federation, uh, accounting for fifty percent of revenue and fifty percent of carbon emission. We, in a way, have to show the way. Uh, and uh, if Mahindra and Mahindra does something and proves that it is uh, a win-win-win situation uh, for the environment, for the business, for our brand, uh, then other group companies would follow suit. And, and that's what we are trying to do. Uh, what I talked about, the LED project, for example, uh, once we implement this in Mahindra and Mahindra, then rest of the group companies, which includes Tech Mahindra, Mahindra Finance, and many other listed companies also, uh, would would see it right to do that. Uh, and and, and uh, we, we, we are doing solar, we are doing wind, we are doing LED, we are doing many other things, uh, examples that, again, my colleagues would, would give you, uh, which all of those have IRR above our threshold. So far, we didn't have to do a single thing that is not financially justified and yet giving us that, that benefit. So we are in a way setting examples for rest of the group. It does not create competition, but it does create a little bit of an aspiration to say if m and can do it, then why not this company or that company or that company and everybody can kind of uh, learn from that and adopt it. Fantastic. Um, I, I wanna remind uh, participants to please submit uh, the questions via the Q&A function. And there are a couple of questions um, uh, Dr. Gunka, that have already come in, and one of them I think is on the minds of many people, which is how do you get internal buy-in for this? And it's easy to say now, of course, there is a financial case for every single thing that you've done. You probably modeled this and had a hunch before, but I'm sure there were a lot of skeptics, and particularly in a company um, that I think has achieved so much by having, you know, very you know focused managers who uh, look for growth opportunities and pursue them. How did you get buy-in um, from skeptics who perhaps thought that this was going to make them turn their eye on something other than the core business, their customers, and growth? So I think, uh, David, it really was uh, not difficult at all uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, first of all, 
it didn't come out as a top down idea uh, and uh, it, it sort of came more from middle management based on what they read what they see what they calculate what they see can be done uh, and and it was more of an approval by management top management and not an idea that was sort of, sort of pushed down by top management and that always increases by number two as i said earlier that this is not in any way compromising with any business interest at least right now okay now it may be that uh, three four years from now we will run out of low-hanging fruits and then we may have to go beyond what may give us the the business return but i don't think that that situation will come very quickly because the human mind will keep innovating on newer and newer things on what we can do which will give us return on the business on the investment as well as reduce carbon footprint. So like I said that we have already done 44% in last seven years and we can easily see right now the next 25% in the next three years and that we can do without compromising with business goals of what the core business is about. So therefore again uh, I don't think that we we saw that and third thing I would say is that Mahindra Rise which was launched in 2011 has already conditioned our mind to think beyond what is uh, financial sort of objective of the business uh, okay and that clearly makes such ideas very well accepted across the group uh, at, at all levels so i think it's a combination of things i never felt uh, at any point of time that i'd do a sell job uh, to anyone uh, to convince them to sign up for the ten dollar uh, carbon price that's that's fantastic well how about the other critical audience the external audience um, you spoke about uh, potential reputational gains, and I'm sure you've seen some of them uh, with policymakers, with uh, uh, non-governmental organizations and others. Could you say a little bit about the benefits there? They're perhaps a little bit harder to measure. Um, and then also, um, to what extent um, other businesses in India uh, have knocked on your door and, and asked uh, uh, to learn uh, how you've gone about this, and to what extent you're even considering helping other companies uh, take similar steps to address, as you said, you know, one of the biggest challenges facing not just India, but the world. So uh, let me uh, take two different constituents, first the government of India and uh, then the other businesses. So I would say that government of India is fully dedicated uh, to uh, looking at how India can reduce its uh, specific carbon footprint. And I focus on the word specific a carbon footprint. Uh, and you would have seen that our prime minister also has always been supportive uh, of, of India playing its role uh, in, in, in reducing carbon emissions. Uh, Government of India has very aggressive programs right now. Uh, they want to promote, uh, non, uh, promote renewable energy, uh, clean energy in a very big way. The LED program that I talked about, in fact, is, is uh, very aggressively pushed by the government of India. Uh, and to the best that I can determine, the government is very happy that a corporate like uh, Mahindra has taken a lead in announcing carbon price and taken a lead being perhaps the first major corporation that has 100% converted or converting to LED. And frankly, the government of India has asked me personally, the minister who is responsible for this has asked me personally to set an example for other corporates. Uh, to, to by talking about our experience with LED and see how everybody can then see that this is creating a win-win situation. Right? So Government of India, I think, is very happy both in terms of how we are using non-renewable, uh, sorry, renewable energy and how we're getting into the more energy efficient uh, use of power. When it comes to other corporations, uh, it is difficult for me to kind of say that is their reaction to it right now? Okay, they probably will be waiting and watching uh, to see uh, what experience Mahindra has. And I would hope that uh, with what we will talk about, which will be uh, uh, saying that this is again not being done because it's the right thing to do. That's not the only reason. It is also being done because it makes business sense. I would hope that we would kind of become evangelist. Uh, for uh, uh, making other corporates uh, in India, large corporates in India, uh, to, to, to follow follow similar things. And I'm sure that right now many corporates are thinking about doing that. There may be some hesitation, but uh, slowly everybody will come forward. Well, and, and this or many will come forward, not everybody. And this is precisely why it's so generous of you to take the time and to share with everybody your experience. I, I'm conscious of your time. Uh, I'm glad uh, that uh, you got to spend a few minutes with everybody. We'll continue the conversation with Anirban and, and Vijay. Sure. Uh, but I just wanted to underscore again um, the importance uh, of having top leadership and top leadership commitment for initiatives like this. And you 
being here and, and joining us for the first 20 minutes or so underscores this. Do you have any closing words, perhaps uh, uh, recommendations for your fellow CEOs and similar people? Yeah, I think uh, what I would say simply is just do it. Uh, and uh, and uh, I don't think that anybody is going to find uh, that uh, by signing up for carbon pricing, as long as you don't go overboard and put something which is, which is irrational. But uh, as long as you say that if I'm here, I add another $2 to that, $3 mm -hmm. to that, it can right. easily be done. And the moment you have that number in front of you, the enough innovative people in every company who will come up with ways and means of achieving that without compromising with business objective. And I keep stressing on that again and again. Sustainability, carbon pricing, carbon footprint reduction is not about compromising with business objective. It is aligned with business objective. And that's the only message I would like to give to anybody who is listening here that uh, I wish to do that. And always as a CEO, keep your eyes and ears open on picking up something from here, something from there that you can go back, tell your guys, and they will be happy to implement it. And I have two experts here to my left and right, and they will take you through uh, all the details that you may be interested in. Thank you, David, for giving me a chance to talk to this uh, large audience. And uh, I personally, uh, I'm, I'm very dedicated to this task, and uh, I think that we can achieve a lot simply by putting our mind to it. We don't have to become uh, something extraordinary. We just need to just put our mind to it and we can, we can achieve a lot. Fantastic. Thank you. Your leadership is, is extraordinary in this, and we thank you for sharing your insights with us. So as uh, Dr. Ganka makes his exit, um, we are now going to continue the conversation uh, with two of the people who played the lead roles in actually getting this done, uh, Ab Mahindra, um, and so, um, Anirban and DJ, we already have uh, a number of questions. We want to know how you made this happen. Uh, how did you arrive at the exact uh, price? Uh, what's covered, the scope, all of these questions. But let me just begin with a slightly broader question, which is how did, how did you get to this? What's been your experience overall um, uh, in this process? Um, has it been as smooth as uh, Dr. Gunka made it sound? I'm not going to attempt to contradict the boss, uh, but give us the inside scoop. And then let's start talking a little bit more technically about who's part of it, what's part of it, how did you go about it, how did you arrive at the $10, and so on. Please. It's, uh, to put it in a simple phrase, it's been a huge learning experience. And uh, the journey was to try and figure out uh, how does one practice sustainability in a manner in which you further the interests of business at the same time you contribute to rejuvenating the environment and enabling stakeholders to rise? So in the process, I must say the uh, Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition, uh, your university, uh, Yale, and the World Economic Forum played a very enabling role. And the conversations we had at conferences, starting from COP21 onwards, were very helpful in getting a, in helping us frame an idea of what this could be like, how could this be implemented, what goals could be taken up. And uh, yes, there were a lot of uh, conversations amongst us, uh, Vijay, myself, Dr. Goenka, and a few more of our colleagues here in the group. Uh, but I say I agree with Dr. Goenka that uh, we didn't have too many uh, very strong skeptics. Uh, the conversation was more about how do you operationalize this? Does it make sense? Uh, and if it makes sense for the business, then what are we waiting for? Yeah. Fascinating. Uh, Vijay, you know, from where you sit on the operation side, um, <coughs> it is the fact that, that a carbon price sort of fits intuitively with the way you know, perhaps engineers and others are thinking about it. You know, uh, we know that, uh, you know, energy is a key input. You know, there's waste. You, you put a number on it and you to use things differently. In other words, is it the fact that it is within the existing paradigm as opposed to a completely different paradigm that really helps in terms of adoption? So, David, I mean, my, I would like to answer this way that, uh, I think uh, Mahindra as organization was always responsible. And to be very frank, uh, sustainability was part of our routine, uh, I will say, KRAs, even from last 10 years. So it is not something which came this thing. Second is, uh, 
as a manufacturing guy uh, when i look at my business goals and one of the major business goal is to keep the cost under control and uh, so if you have to do that and uh, if you are in this part of the world where uh, i mean if i compare with america where uh, maybe 25% of conversion cost will be utilities i mean water electricity and lpg and related things while in india it is close to 75% so energy was always something which is very critical for us and the second is that uh, not only that i mean we have a shortage as well okay so both these things were big reasons to drive this okay so we were driving this conventionally from very long time yes after uh, we were approached by climate group and when they come and they say that will you like to join ep 100 i mean that was the first point where you suddenly get much more excited that you will be among the leaders in the world who will come back and say that i will do it when we looked at look back the expectation was that 2005 to 2000 between 2005 to 2030 you improve or double the energy productivity and when we looked at our records we found in uh, if i look at together ad and uh, tractor business in last 7 years we had done 44% so to me it looked that oh why not and this thing so all these things no and then uh, i think it got lot of energy in the system people loved it really it is bottom of approach it is not top driven to be very frank uh, uh, the ideas come from uh, our people who are on the shop floor because everybody has a business goal to reduce uh, the conversion cost only thing is they look for that we support that and make it happen and as doctor said the I minute mean, was everywhere we found that it's a opportunity That's it never came as a burden okay and when uh, anir talked about carbon pricing and then he started talking to me so doctor uh, doctor goinka gave me task that why don't you go to each of our the four ceos and presidents and go and explain them when i walk to them okay and i said it's going to help your business i mean everybody was raising hand that why not so so it was i mean i, I think it went very very well That's and before I this thing, I mean, let let me let, 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 give me a chance to this thing. There, the building I am sitting today, okay, is IGBC platinum rated building. Okay, now actually this building is thirty years old, and in last six months we worked on it to get it platinum rated. So that itself is a big testimony of what I am saying. Well, the the building that we're in is is lead gold, so we're going to have to have you be over, come over here, and help us get to platinum. Um, you know, but would you, would you capture just now such a powerful insight that these initiatives have to be bottom up and not top down? Uh, that the engineers on the shop floor see the opportunities, they see the the waste and inefficiencies. Um, but of course, in order for them to do this, there has to be an incentive, uh, which is why carbon pricing becomes so powerful. But we also know. that if you set the wrong incentive you might uh reward the wrong behavior whatever wrong might mean which is why um you know the devil is in the details so so could you take us into um how you designed um the policy uh how you uh, identified uh the price of $10 Dr. Gurnka made a couple of comments about 6 to 7 and then said let's be a little bit more ambitious if you could tell us a little bit more about this And also, why you decided to opt for this hybrid approach with the real price, not the price. So, so, so take us under the hood, if you will. Take us into the mechanics of this. Let me take that for you, David. Um, so, when we started on the journey, uh, the question of uh, what would be a good price was obviously one of the questions we were grappling with. Yeah. Uh, by and by. that there are many different kinds of carbon pricing and if you adopted shadow carbon pricing then the price that made sense was somewhere in the range of $50 or $60 and so on but we also realized that the primary purpose of adopting of carbon pricing was to use it as a tool to reduce your carbon footprint 
And we were then looking at what is the best way, or, well, I won't say best, what is a way in which we can get this done without having to disrupt the system? And we found a way by saying that, okay, uh, at this point in time, the investments that we are making, which can be attributed to reducing carbon footprint are of a certain order, which sort of leads to uh, $6 or $7 per ton of carbon emitted. And we asked the question, what's the ambition for tomorrow? And here, the goal of reducing carbon footprint by 25% over the next three years came handy. So we, we asked the question, okay, if we have to achieve this, what are the sort of investments we need to make? And that sort of resulted in a number which was very close to $10, just a little bit lower, and said, okay, let's stretch it, make it a round figure, let's take $10 as our carbon price on the business, make the necessary investments, keeping in mind that the real goal is to uh, reduce our carbon footprint by 25%. Now, in the journey, we also realized that you, uh, these different kinds of carbon pricing are not mutually exclusive. They're actually complementary in nature. So when we are saying we will invest $10 per ton of carbon emitted, we have to go out and buy technology to implement. Now, in the process of buying technology, we'll have options to consider. How do you trade off between those options? And this is where shadow pricing comes very handy. And uh, therefore, we are considering not only using the $10 price that we've already set, but also looking at using a shadow price in the procurement uh, function to as a complement to the $10 that we've announced so that the work sort of goes together. At the end of the day, we achieve our 25% uh, carbon footprint reduction goal in three years' time. So that really was the way in which we looked at how, why $10 and why the possibility of doing a hybrid uh, strategy. Fantastic. And, and the revenue then that is raised in quotation marks goes directly into investments to achieve the 25%? Yes, the quotation marks are important. <laughs> Yeah, because there's, there's really no revenue. It's a commitment to invest. Yeah. There you go. The, the investment contribution, let's call it that way. Um, so, right. and, and then what role, uh, for example, do some of these engineers, uh, VJ, that you spoke about or others play in steering some of those funds? And otherwise, in other words, is the allocation of the investment top down or do the various business units uh, get their share? Do they compete for funds? How does that work? So, I mean, uh, what we have is, uh, if we look at the locations we have, because I'm basically talking about scope one and scope two. Uh, so, if I look at locations in the country, we have 17 big locations, manufacturing locations for auto and tractor, and we will have another seven, eight small uh, locations. And incidentally, I, I coordinate for all the locations uh, even if they are not part of auto for uh, this drive. So what we do is, I mean, uh, there is a huge internal competition among the locations, okay? And we model these things at one, this thing. So like this idea of LED, we have a location of where we make power trains, uh, something like 190 kilometers from Mumbai, a place known as Igatpuri, where this idea came in a very small way. Okay. And uh, then we said, let's try that. And when we tried that and we felt it make, making sense, then everybody wanted to copy it. So, so that way, location to locate somewhere, we are taking somebody to take lead on uh, water, somewhere somebody is taking lead on biodiversity, somewhere somebody is taking lead on green building, somebody somewhere is taking lead on LED, somebody is taking on solar, somebody is taking on biogas, and uh, you see some successes, people go and see and see the benefits out it, and they come back to their business leaders saying that, oh, this is the investment, this is the results, already proven, why I, don't, uh, why I should not do it. And uh, to be very frank, like when, when we were talking about wind power, uh, I remember uh, one and a half year back between Anirban and me, we had a lot of discussion. And we were told that it's going to be difficult because it will not be really making business sense. 
and uh, i was in a place in india southern of india kerala and i found many windmills hold i mean being held by very small players and i said if these guys are doing there has to be some business sense let's come back and work on it okay we found that uh, the money we make is more than what we make in our main business no so when we went to the leadership and saying this is the money this is the return and incidentally it is one and a half times of the money we make in our regular business shall we go for it i mean there was no no question it was just signed no in minutes no so now actually people are looking for such opportunities and they say come back with such opportunities and we reward those guys who really do that in fact there is a uh, there is a process which i must share with you david on this uh, vijay is very lucky you know during the capital budgeting process he gets hordes of projects to choose from so his challenge really is not uh, i mean is to choose from the list that he gets and uh, he has a very nice metric and this metric was formed within this business which uh, includes both the reduction in emissions as well as the uh, investments and payback and that combined metric keeps everybody happy and once we use that metric and sort the projects in descending order of impact uh, investments become easy fantastic um as you look into the future i mean that the 25% in 3 years is such an ambitious goal it also means though that you know probably within a year you'll start having a conversation about what comes after that uh and and i realize that you're still learning about the experience and so this may be a little premature but i'm curious if you if you think um your instinct will be to continue to couple the carbon pricing scheme to your overall carbon footprint reduction goal in other words you'll pick the next goal think again what investment might be required and that might then lead to a change in the internal price is is that how we should think about it or is it not clear or did i not okay. so so david i mean uh, uh, to be very frank we have what we call promise cycle every 3 years we set uh, goals for us which are not really business targets but what we feel is what we have to do as organization some we achieve and some become yellow and some we don't even achieve so normally when it was coming to a subject like sustainability we were saying gri gri index and all those time this time across business in mmm we have taken this as a target that we will have 25% on uh, energy and 25% on water now water becomes important because of last to last year we had i mean we had two years when it was really bad for the country when the rains were short and all those things and we were seeing uh, business even as a risk no so now these two things we have taken as a target some things we know and some things we don't know when you walk the path no some things you know and then you move okay so if you ask me that do you have answer for all the 25% reduction how you will achieve no but do we have answer for next 40 50% yes and those when when you are walking that talk, uh, this thing path no and if you are uh, curious about it if you are innovating if you are looking around the world okay opportunities are coming and incidentally in this field the opportunity which has come in last 3 4 years would not have come in last 30 years no so we we are very sure that there will be many opportunities coming and we will hit them uh, continuously one by one okay that's that's great and um you know i think i like the idea of a promise cycle i mean there there's only so much one can do uh but you know being ambitious and setting and setting us like this is of course the the key to it um can i ask you we're getting some questions about uh, some issues that dr garnka hinted at which are of course your products um and and the downstream part of this and perhaps let me broaden it beyond products and just sort of think about you know key external stakeholders in other words um to what extent does this way of thinking that you have now institutionalized within the business put you in a position for example where this might become a factor uh in your procurement um where you actually you could be extending an approach uh to that uh, to some of your suppliers and and use 
uh, carbon efficiency not just as a way of making investment decisions within the company, but also purchase decisions. Um, to what extent does it directly influence the way you're thinking about the efficiency of your products, uh, you know, four wheelers? Here in the US, of course, we have your electric two wheelers, uh, you know, an area where, where uh, you're a leader. Could you say a little bit about that up and down the value chain? So David, as you know, in automobiles, the, o, the OEM, uh, his major job is essentially assembly. And about 70% of the value of the vehicle is purchased from suppliers. So if we want to be effective in sustainability, we have little choice but to work with suppliers and enable them to practice sustainability. So this, it's a journey that started some time ago and uh, sustainability factors are a critical part of uh, the purchase process within the company. In fact, we have an annual uh, conference for uh, suppliers. About four years ago, I was speaking to them in that conference on how sustainability can help them build their business in pretty much the same manner that Dr. Goenka shared with you a little while earlier. And there is a reward system that we have for suppliers. Uh, within this reward system, sustainability parameters are now embedded. And therefore, the practice of sustainability is critical for the supplier if he wishes to be a high performer and get the rewards in our supplier ecosystem. In fact, not only have we worked with suppliers in this manner, we've taken this practice to our dealers as well. And the dealers also have a reward system where sustainability plays a very big role. And this is how we're taking it both uh, right through the supply chain through uh, to suppliers and to dealers as well. I hope I addressed your question. Absolutely, perfectly. And, and, and that's so ambitious and just underscores again that the carbon price is only one piece uh, of a broad uh, sustainability initiative you know, across uh, your entire value chain. Um, I, I'm curious, we're getting one question uh, specifically around uh, job creation. Um, and whether you have any mm -hmm. thoughts on this, uh, again, perhaps this is uh, a uh, sort of Western mindset where people are thinking zero sum and as you become more efficient, you might become less productive or you might be putting jobs on the line. Um, in your case, of course, a lot of it has been about targeting investments in order to achieve business goals and sustainability goals. But I wonder if, if, if you were confronted with a skeptic who would say this is going to lead to job losses, can you... So put your finger on saying, no, look, uh, you know, we're, we're growing better as a result of this, or we're uh, in need of more talent as a result of this. You want to take that? Yeah, so I, I, I think uh, uh, maybe uh, different countries and different zones will have different perspective. When we look at India, I think uh, this will not lead to any job loss rather we will be able to conserve some energy some water some land for something which can be used uh, more profitably so my feeling is it will really add to growth not reduce anything so, at least in a country like india let me put a spin on this david uh, one big area of work is energy efficiency which means uh, using energy efficient motors, energy efficient appliances, energy efficient electrical devices. Production of these energy efficient devices today is a very big thing in companies like Siemens and Philips and a whole bunch of others who, are, who provide us this equipment. Yeah. This industry is growing. So the adoption of energy efficient practices by people like us is leading to growth in other industries and therefore leading to uh, greater employment. So when we look at it at the system level, there is no way there will be job losses. Fantastic. Um, let me ask, I'm sort of going back to the more technical side now because we've just got another interesting question that I want to give you an opportunity to highlight. Uh, and then we'll probably conclude with some observations uh, and, and your recommendations for practitioners. Um, at the sort of management level, mid-management mid, uh, level, what have been some of the challenges of operationalizing this? And I, and I mean by that, uh, there's, got, there, there's measurement that now has to happen. 
Uh, people have to keep track of things. Um, you have to diffuse results. I, I assume there's a whole lot of transparency involved in this. You spoke, VJ, before about the competition among the 17 sites. Um, sort of between the sort of bottom, sort of ground level enthusiasm and the clear top level support that we heard from Dr. Gunka and you, what, what are the sort of what is sort of the mid layer that you need to put in place and what challenges have you encountered there? Or did it just slot into your existing, you know, reporting and it wasn't all that complicated? Uh, I will say that uh, I think we were not very good in measuring where our energy is getting consumed within the organization. So like, uh, you have uh, many m machines, you have uh, uh, many offices, many places. So one of the things which took some time was to really bring accountability of every unit of energy consumed at various places. And once we had that, then things started becoming really easy. And one of the thing which like uh, doctor talked about, Dr. Goinka talked about LED, now the second thing which we are trying to do is we looked at how much energy we consume in MMM group, no, uh, limited, sorry, not the group. And uh, it's close to 250 crores, which is nothing but 40 million US dollars. Then we looked at how much of it is going in the motors. No? And we found that almost 70% of that is being used in various electric motors. And those motors, at least 50% of them are gen when, gen uh, first or something. I mean, at least 15 years old technology. And we then we try to look at it that if we change them to current, which are much more efficient, how do I, how much I save? And to our surprise, the buyback period or the payback is 16 months okay so normally you will say that live with the motor till it fails when it fails you replace with something which is more efficient and now we have but now the opportunity is don't worry about it look at it find some money and replace all of them so now for doing it now this is a hypothesis we thought we will just prove it okay this comes on a piece of paper that it will look like this we just selected seven or eight of them bought them, changed it, try for six months, prove it, go for a big way. So so I, I think it's once you're able to measure everything and you know where exactly your energy is going, okay, then that's a start point or maybe that's a point where you can then take big decisions now. So that's, that's a really important insight. So you need to create this infrastructure of measurement and accountability in order to then put decision makers such as yourselves, but many others also into a position of doing things that, you know, probably aren't rocket science, but you wouldn't have necessarily thought of as your starting point um, without that data. So, so um, we're getting a number of questions from people who are, who are just really uh, inspired by what you've done there. Uh, and you've done it, I underscore this again, uh, in an environment where it is perhaps more challenging, but the rewards seem to be greater. What do I mean by that? You know, you look at, you know, service oriented or service companies in, in Western countries that for a number of reasons perhaps have been sort of gradually been increasing their efficiency and they're putting in place ambitious schemes, but perhaps the return from an environmental perspective is somewhat limited. You're really having extraordinary gains um, in a fast growing group uh, in an incredibly fast growing large economy. So as far as impact is concerned, you know, it's just extraordinary. So, so I'm curious, uh, first of all, how you are, um, whether you'll continue to engage with stakeholders, with other companies, with the government, with nonprofits, with forums such as yourself to keep people posted about this progress. And, and I ask this question because a number of people here are asking how they can, how they can continue to learn about the lessons uh, that you are learning, whether you'll be publishing uh, regular reports, uh, other ways of diffusing your insights. Where, where should people go to, to learn a year from now, two years from now, three years from now where you are? 
I love that question. It almost suggests that uh, David, you'll be doing another webinar with us about a year from now. <laughs> right. No, uh, learning is a continuous process, uh, and uh, there are brothers here in uh, India, all chief sustainability officers of various companies. I must say we're very good friends, and uh, we spend a fair amount of time with each other at various conferences, and very often we get invited to speak at each other's corporations and share the learnings that we've had and what we are doing in the hope that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, you tend to learn better from people from outside your own organization than within. So whichever way it works, it's fine. I mean, and it's, uh, we're all in the same game of trying to uh, rejuvenate the environment and enabling stakeholders to rise. So we're quite happy to contribute. And uh, there are a couple of things which we've done in recent times which are worth mentioning. One is to build a framework for sustainability for the Mahindra Group. And one of the elements of that framework is to talk about is uh, partnership, learning and sharing. So all three are strong elements of work in sustainability within the Mahindra Group, which is where uh, I think that question is leading to. The second one uh, is we've actually put together for ourselves a document which we call the Carbon Pricing Primer. It is to help the businesses who haven't yet adopted the practice understand that it can work well for them. Maybe in the near future, uh, we might find an edition which we'll be happy to put out to anybody else who would wish to learn from our experience. Fantastic. And you've been so generous to share um, your insights and your experience. I mean, this has been absolutely fascinating. Um, we only have a couple more minutes and, and I want to start wrapping up. Are there lessons that you have learned, you know, personal lessons, organizational lessons um, that you want to make sure practitioners who are thinking about implementing a carbon pricing scheme should be aware of that we haven't yet covered? David, uh, I think uh, we kept on talking about uh, left brain, rational, this thing. Let me talk the right brain, no? Uh, we, are, we belong to a country where the size of, I mean, the people below 35 years of age is a sizable population, okay? When you share with these thoughts with them, no? You, you bring a lot of energy in the system because they feel that they are working for a planet which they are going to live tomorrow, okay, which acts. If I look at our employees, and when we live in a country where energy is a scarcity, and then if I say that the energy we saved last year is equivalent to 20,000 houses which can be lit because of that, it leaves a very positive this thing. So when it comes to employees who, who are with us, they, they, when they look at what they get from this company, they feel, a, a, I mean, the feeling of pride, okay, that I am contributing, I am working for a company which contributes to these things, adds to a lot of value, okay. I think that is something which will make sure that we continue this on path very, very long. We do find that uh, work in sustainability helps make our corporation a great place to work. It also helps to make sustainability personal for our colleagues. But one interesting uh, learning which I'd want to share with you is the fact that typically a CEO never looks at his utilities bill. It's just meant to be settled. Through this work, we've learned that there is gold in the utilities bill and there is a lot of money to be made in that. So we would think that if the right people in the organization were to pay attention to the energy that is being used, which is not needed to be used. There is a lot of impact that we can make to rejuvenate the environment. Well, those are two incredibly powerful lessons and the perfect place to leave it at. Um, you know, what it does to people, how it motivates people, how it gives them purpose, and uh, how sometimes, you know, gold and value can be in something that we may think of as being quite mundane, which is your utility bill. Um, I want to thank both of you. I want to thank Dr. Ganka. I want to thank uh, all of you at Mahindra for your leadership on this issue. Uh, and as true leaders and in keeping with the RISE philosophy, your willingness to share this uh, with the world. 
Um, I want to thank also uh, many of your colleagues who weren't visible on the screen who've been working behind the scenes to make this possible. This is actually fairly complex technically, so our thanks to them as well. Uh, my thanks to uh, my colleagues here at Yale uh, who've been working to set this up and are supporting this entire series. Uh, thank you, of course, to our friends at the World Economic Forum and the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition uh, who are uh, supporting these efforts. Um, this webinar itself uh, will be available within a couple of days uh, on demand from the Yale Center for Business and the Environment website, and I hope uh, you will all stay tuned um, for future webinars uh, where we uh, connect with uh, other leading companies uh, and learn what they have done. This is very much a positive sum game. Everybody is experimenting, uh, everybody is learning, and to the extent to which uh, we can all benefit from their lessons, our ability to uh, uh, you know, achieve this ultimate goal, which is to do well by doing good, I think is greatly enhanced. So thank you so much again to all of you. Uh, we'll stay tuned and watch your progress, and we would love to have you back in a couple of years and hear uh, what else you have achieved uh, uh, with this wonderful initiative. Thank you again. Thank you very much, David, thank and you. thank you to everybody thank who participated much. in the webinar.